Bienvenidos a todos, espero que estén escuchando bien. Tuvimos un inconveniente ahora al comienzo por el cual eh, nos estaban escuchando en la previa en lugar de que sea una sala de espera cerrada como suele ser. Así que los estuvimos entreteniendo un poco. Bueno, los saludo acá, mi nombre es Cintia Fran, yo eh, estoy coordinando el capítulo argentino-uruguay, eh, que esperamos ya seis meses desde su fundación. Estamos muy contentos con pertenecer a, a la Fundación Elisa Kibla Ross por estos eh, lares aquí por el sur. Y bueno, estamos realmente encantados con la respuesta que tuvo esta propuesta este tema que, que hoy, hoy nos trae a estar aquí, que tiene que ver con todos estos temas eh, tan humanos como son la muerte, la enfermedad, las pérdidas, los duelos, y que en general son temas que no son tan convocantes, con lo cual celebramos que esto esté ocurriendo hoy aquí. Y esperamos que, que se lleven algo de lo que están buscando y, y que sea un, un encuentro muy enriquecedor para cada uno de ustedes. Bien. Eh, el orador que tenemos hoy es un lujo, es el doctor eh, Tim Connor, él es miembro del, de la Junta Directiva de la Fundación Madre, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, también está aquí otro de los miembros de la Fundación, en realidad el presidente, que es Ken Ross, es hijo de Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, así que agradecemos su presencia. Y mm, en un momento más les voy a contar algo más de quién es Tim Connor. Les quiero decir algo más sobre el tema. La, la negación y la esperanza son como dos pilares importantes en, en el proceso que hace una persona que está atravesando una enfermedad que pone en riesgo su vida y también de las personas que la están acompañando, ya sea en rol profesional o no, y de sus familiares y seres queridos. Queremos invitarlos en esta propuesta a, a soltar eh, juicios más absolutos, quizás ya son buenas o malas, ¿no? La, la negación y la esperanza, y entrar un poco en la complejidad humana en la cual todo esto se diluye y empieza el mundo, el mundo artesanal, ¿no? de la vida única de cada uno y cómo esto se juega en la vida de cada uno. Y si el legado de Elizabeth eh, Kubler-Ross, queremos también invitarlos, no sabemos eh, cuántos de ustedes han sido convocados porque ustedes mismos están pasando un momento difícil, porque algún ser querido lo está pasando, si vienen en rol de acompañantes, de voluntarios, de profesionales de la salud, eh, los invitamos cual sea el rol en el cual estén eh, hoy aquí, que, que lo pasen por ustedes mismos primero, ver cuál es el rol que la, que, que la, la esperanza y la negación ha tenido en sus vidas personales, ¿sí?, porque sobre esas reflexiones y el trabajo que hagan ustedes mismos, sobre qué rol, cuál es mi vínculo con la esperanza y con la negación, es solamente desde allí, desde nuestra humanidad, que vamos a poder acompañar a otro a, a darles un lugar lo más saludable posible en sus vidas. ¿sí? Elizabeth hacía mucho hincapié en, en el trabajo personal, en que primero somos personas ¿no? y después ocupamos roles. Bien, les cuento algo más acerca de quién es nuestro orador de hoy, Steven. Steven Connor es eh, director ejecutivo de la organización benéfica con sede en Londres, en, en Reino Unido, de la Alianza Internacional de Hospicios y Cuidados Paliativos. Es una alianza con más de 350 organizaciones nacionales y regionales de cuidados paliativos y hospicios en 102 países de todo el mundo. El doctor Connor ha trabajado continuamente en el movimiento de cuidados paliativos y el movimiento Hospice desde 1975, incluyendo como vicepresidente de la organización, incluyendo el, el rol de vicepresidente de la Organización Nacional de Hospicios y Cuidados Paliativos en Estados Unidos. Ahora se centra en el desarrollo de cuidados paliativos a nivel internacional, de alianza que él preside, y ha trabajado en cuidados paliativos a nivel mundial en más de 25 países. Además, es investigador, educador y psicoterapeuta. Ha publicado más de 145 artículos de revistas y capítulos de libros sobre temas relacionados con los cuidados paliativos para pacientes y sus familias. Es autor y editor de seis libros sobre el tema, incluyendo el nuevo Atlas Global de Cuidados Paliativos del año 2020, que es una publicación que hizo desde esta alianza que él preside en asociación con la Organización Mundial de la Salud. El doctor Connor es, como ya les había dicho, miembro de la Junta Directiva de la Fundación Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Bien, ahora eh, Victoria va a proceder a, 
a traducir esto dicho para las personas de habla inglesa. A warm welcome to you all from Argentina, the Argentino Uruguay chapter of the Elizabeth Kubler Ross Foundation. Ours is a recent initiative which we envision as a joint effort of six of us representing our two countries. It's very encouraging to find such a great response in regard to today's presentation, a challenging topic that touches life as a whole when it comes to loss, grief, sickness, and dying, all of which are gaining so much more awareness in our days. Today, we feel very honored to present Dr. Stephen Connor. The selected topic of this series of three webinars starting today is about hope and denial and the many nuances they present along the process of life-threatening illness experienced by patients, their caregivers, and loved ones. We would like to invite you to let go of definitions and absolute categories that tend to define hope and denial as good or bad. Instead, we would like to explore the complexity of human experience with a flexible and open mind. In the spirit of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross legacy, we hope that whatever resonates with you along Dr. Connor's presentation may become food for thought for a more personal inquiry on how you experience denial and hope in your own lives. Elizabeth was very keen when it came to our relationship with patients, always reminding us that ultimately we are human beings and that is what we bring to the bedside. And now we would like to introduce Stephen Connor to you. Uh, Dr. Stephen Connor is the Executive Director of the London, UK-based Worldwide Hospice Palliative Care Alliance, an alliance of over 350 national and regional hospice and palliative care organizations in 102 countries. Dr. Connor has worked continuously in the hospice palliative care movement since 1975, including as Vice President of the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization in the U.S., He's now focusing on palliative care development internationally with the WHPCA and has worked on palliative care globally in over 25 countries. In addition to being a hospice and association executive, he's a researcher, educator, advocate, and psychotherapist, licensed as a clinical psychologist. Dr. Connor has published over 145 peer-reviewed journal articles, reviews, and book chapters on the issues related to palliative care for patients and their families, and is the author, editor of six books on palliative care, including a new global atlas of palliative care in partnership with the WHO. He's also a trustee of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Global Foundation. So I'm, I'm gonna switch into Spanish for just a second. Uh, por favor, les queremos pedir que dejen silenciados sus micrófonos durante todo el evento. Luego de la exposición del Dr. Connor, habrá unos 15 minutos para hacer preguntas. Les agradecemos para mayor agilidad que no escriban en el chat las preguntas durante la charla, sino solo lo hagan al final eh, de la presentación. Y si por favor pueden empezar cada una de sus preguntas con esa palabra, pregunta, porque así no será más fácil identificarlas. Les recordamos además que este evento está siendo grabado y estará disponible en nuestro canal de YouTube. Y por último, decirle muchas gracias a Melissa que hoy nos dona su tiempo y habilidad como intérprete. Para acceder al canal de traducción al español, eh, se trata de tocar el botón abajo a su derecha donde dice eh, traducción, canal español. Um, I think, Stephen, the room is all yours. So. Well, it's a real pleasure to be with, with all of you. I think, buenas noches. Um, we are all students of Elizabeth still to this day. So we continue to learn uh, from her example. And she was really one of the founders of uh, hospice and palliative care in the world. I'm going to go ahead and start uh, the presentation slides, I hope. Here we go. We're, we're good, you can see that? Okay. So um, 
I was really um, pleased to be able to um, have a chance to talk about this topic. It was it's one of the most uh, important ones. Um, and actually, my dissertation when I, uh, for my PhD was actually on um, intervention with people who appear to be uh, using denial like coping. Let's advance. This, um, I was intrigued somewhat that, um, that people were still reading something I wrote back in 1998, uh, the uh, chapter on the ethics of hope and denial in this book, which is clinical uh, ethical issues in the care of the dying uh, and bereaved agent done by my oh, dear old friend, Jack Morgan, uh, who was the editor of this series. Um, it was mentioned that we uh, are in official relations with the World Health Organization. And just to give you kind of a, a broad scope of the uh, amount of suffering and dying that goes on on our planet every year, um, we have at least a million people a week who die um, on planet Earth, on, the, on this planet. And uh, almost, um, almost half of those uh, are identified as needing palliative care. 25.7 million was the latest estimate, but we people need palliative care long before the year in which they die. So um, the total number is around 57 million people a year, which is a, a huge amount. Um, we have most of those people suffering from non-communicable diseases, about uh, almost 70%. Most, three, over three quarters live in low and middle income countries, not high income countries. Most are older but we have also a significant number of children. At least 7% of the need is for children needing palliative care. And we never care for a person, a, pa a patient, without also caring for their family. And that are sometimes big families, sometimes small families, but I think that puts the order of magnitude, you know, well into over 200 million people a year that need our, our uh, services with palliative care. Uh, and most of those people don't get palliative care. Only about 12% uh, are getting palliative care. Um, and also, um, most of those people are dying in pain. They don't actually have adequate access to essential medicines for palliative care. Uh, so when uh, we talk about this subject, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a topic for society, but it's in the context of uh, an enormous number of uh, people dying every year. And now we have the coronavirus to complicate matters which has increased the number. These numbers are from 2019. So really we have um, quite a few more people and they're dying in circumstances where, where they're unable to communicate with their family. They're unable to attend funerals and have the access to social rituals that are so important in the grief process. So what we're gonna talk about today is some of the ethics about truth telling. Uh, I loved your introduction and in talking about how uh, yeah, what Elizabeth taught us that you know there's no absolutes here that you know a hope has different meaning, denial is has, serves different purposes, and we'll talk about what what those uh, what we mean when we say denial. What is it? What is hope? What do we what do we mean when we say hope? Well, what about intervening with people when they're dying, and how do our relationship with them? How does our relationship with them affect how those interventions happen? Uh, we'll have, we'll discuss a, a few case studies. We'll have a short video. Uh, we'll talk about, um, also about breaking bad news and just some general suggestions for um, uh, how to approach this, this difficult uh, issue about, uh, about truth telling and denial. So when we say ethical issues, what do we mean? Uh, principally, we're talking about the ethical principles of autonomy uh, which is um, the freedom to make decisions for oneself and to have um, um, things decided by the person who's most affected. Uh, dignity, which is the state of being worthy, of being honored or esteemed and respected and to be seen and heard and listened to and treated fairly and with respect, uh, to be recognized, understood, and to be safe in the world, to feel safe in the world. Um, that's an important principle. Non-maleficence, of course, is the medical principle of do no harm. Um, you know, and, and these all interplay when we talk about 
telling people the truth? Is it a harmful thing to do? What underlies the fear of truth telling is that the truth will hurt. The truth will harm in some way. However, there's no evidence that telling people their diagnosis or prognosis or, or other bad news actually causes shortened survival or uh, actually does harm. Uh, we oftentimes will see a person react to the bad news, but um, there are other consequences to not telling the truth that are, can be harmful. And, and everybody's different. We all have to approach people, uh, meeting them where they are. Clearly, the person who is living with the illness is the holder of the right to decide whether to be told or not that they're dying. And that's never done in a vacuum. All of us are part of a family system. And the family unit is taken into consideration whenever we make these kinds of decisions. Um, and to be treated with, with respect uh, and, uh, and agency um, uh, means we, we don't want to impose uh, uh, and take away these rights, these ethical rights for people. We, uh, I, I was a, a member, or I, I am a member <laughs> of the International Work Group on Death, Dying, and Bereavement, which was founded in part by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and uh, Dame Cicely Saunders, who was the founder of the modern hospice movement. And one of the things we, we do at these invitation, invitational meetings, leaders in the field of death, dying, and bereavement, is try to help understand what are some of the universal truths about um, uh, death, dying, and bereavement? And we wrote back in 93 uh, assumptions and principles concerning psychological care of dying persons and their families. Um, it's a good read. Uh, but some of the uh, principles that we came to as universal principles that have to do with truth telling uh, were, first of all, the right to choose whether or not to be told you're dying. Um, then if you choose to be told, you have a right to be told um, that your, your life is going to be shortened. And then what you do with that information is your business. So you have a right to acknowledge or to not acknowledge that you're dying. And people will, will make that choice in various ways and very, to varying degrees. And we'll communicate about that. Uh, sometimes verbally straightforward, sometimes non-verbally with their body language and behavior, and sometimes in using symbolic language to talk about, about death in ways that um, make sense from a cultural standpoint. So when, when we talk about denial, what are we, what are we talking about? We're, we're going to talk about some of the theories, uh, where, where that concept came from. Um, we're going to talk about some of the way it's changed and evolved over time. We're going to talk about some of the differences between what, what I call interpersonal versus intrapsychic denial. Uh, we'll talk about intervention, talk about the context, the social context of denial and how that influences uh, how people um, tell the truth or not. And whether denial is, is really more of a cultural thing or a psychological thing in societies, death denying societies. We know from Latin America that we have uh, an extraordinarily rich uh, cultural heritage in, in Mexico of the Day of the Dead, uh, where the dead um, are honored and continued to and made part of daily life. Um, I, many of you may have seen the movie Coco. I thought that was really a sweet movie to kind of talk about how important it is that um, that we that we recognize that people die and that we can that we have a continuing relationship with them. We used to think in grief that you had to sort of cut off your relationship with people when they died, but now we think of uh, continuing bonds and the importance of maintaining um, a relationship with with people um, in your emotional world in a different place than uh, they were when they were alive. But regarding the importance of that. <clears throat> So the first person who came up with the term denial was um, Sigmund Freud, the founder of modern psychotherapy, um, who actually was studying fetishism at the time in 1911 when he published uh, uh, some papers about this. Uh, and he was trying to figure out how is it that the person can actually take an object and sexualize it and uh, make it something different than it is. It did. What sort of psychological process could uh, could allow that to happen, and he came up with this idea about disavowal, uh, which for which was was to just 
to, to ignore or to fundamentally change what is, for most of us, what we would view as reality. Um, he thought it was a very primitive defense. Um, actually, he thought people who, did, uh, who, who denied reality were actually psychotic, that they had, that, that was a psychotic defense. Uh, because the interpsychic conflict was too um, overwhelming to be able to acknowledge reality. And really, I think um, it's, an, it's an understanding that some people lack the inner strength to cope with hard realities. And, but I think we think that actually is a very, a very small part of the human family. As time went on, um, Anna, his daughter, you know, it, it be, viewed it more as a neurotic kind of um, response to, to, to reality. And then in the 50s and 60s, uh, Norma Hahn and others began to view denial, uh, all defenses as really more, they're more like coping mechanisms than defenses, not like a wall put up, but um, a way of adjusting your behavior to, uh, you know, uh, to deal with a challenge in your, in your world, in your life. And Elizabeth uh, really tried to temporize it by saying, okay, it's like a it's like a psychic shock absorber. It's something as a temporary, um, you know, way of coping with a hard reality that um, people needed to get through. And Avery Weissman uh, talked about it in terms of, 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 of temporal uh, time that uh, in his lovely book on denying, on dying and denying, first order denial was to deny the main facts. In other words, um, I don't have cancer. They made a mistake in the lab. There's something wrong. Uh, I'm, I'm, I definitely don't have cancer, uh, which then gets replaced later by, yeah, I have cancer, but it's not a big deal. I'm going to get through this. Okay, it's fine. I'm not going to, not going to be a problem. And then third order denial was, yeah, yeah, cancer. I've got cancer. It's serious. It's a serious illness, but it won't kill me. I can't deny. I can't possibly die from this. So just thinking about that progression of uh, responses. And Thomas Hackett was, I think, for me, really important to understand that denial, that, there, that, that there's a real social aspect to denial, uh, that it's about our relationships with other people more than it is potentially about our relationship with ourself and our psyche. And uh, Richard Lazarus, who talked about, basically, denial has both positive and negative consequences, and that's based on the timing uh, when, like, uh, like Avery uh, Weissman said, the timing, the circumstances, and the pervasiveness is how pervasive is it? And uh, he came up. He he came up. He said he's a researcher that studies stress and coping a lot, and talked about uh, how cognitive appraisal, how do we appraise something, is a, a key issue. Um, and when we face something like a terminal illness, um, problem-focused coping doesn't work very well. I mean, if we have a problem in our life, we, if we try to fix it by solving the problem, when we can't solve the problem, we use emotion to adjust our response, our coping to the situation. And that's what happens in uh, serious illness is that people use it and change the way they feel about it. Um, and oftentimes denial, I've seen this very often with clinicians that, that uh, people will say, oh, that patient's in denial. And it's, you know they're not being very clear about what they mean by that. Um, it may not be denial that you're seeing. It may just be a way of you distancing yourself from the person or labeling them. And sometimes I'm in denial and I like it. <laughs> it can be, can be sort of uh, pleasant, particularly if you're a child growing up. Kids use denial all the time uh, in uh, their coping simple ways. So what do we mean by hope? It has many different meanings. Obviously, you know, most people think about it as, oh, I want to be cured of the illness that I have or get a remission or at least not suffer as a result of it. Also, other things, uh, um, res resolution of conflict, uh, healing old wounds, patching up relationships, saying you're sorry, saying um, goodbye to people. And then finally, you know, maybe having the right people to care for you, the the caregivers you want and being in the place that you would like to be when you're when you're very seriously ill. Um, but there's a whole lot of uncertainty when it comes to dealing with a serious um, life limiting illness. And a lot of times what we see are is what I see more very commonly is ambivalence, um, which is a combination of the hope that you're going to get better at the same time, 
you've been battling the illness for a long time and you feel like, Oh God, I, you know, I wish I, I wish this would get over with. And, and the reality is that you can hold both of those realities simultaneously to hope for the best and plan for the worst. Many times when we're dealing with people who are using coping mechanisms to try to uh, push aside the reality that they're facing, we, it's partly because they feel like, well, I can't possibly admit that I'm this sick or it'll make me worse. Um, you know, this is the uh, positive thinking uh, trap. Um, the reality is that you can hold both realities. And we try to teach people how to do that to say, yeah, we want you to live. We want you to get better. We want everything good for you. But at the same time, we know that you have a serious illness and you have to have to deal with reality to some extent. So when I was trained originally, um, we were told not to challenge people's defenses, um, not, not to push it all uh, against that. And um, I think the new thinking is that, that more of what we think of as denial is about interpersonal relationships and the fear that talking openly will either scare people away or will harm them in some way. Uh, when the reality is, it's like what we do to try to fix the problem oftentimes makes it worse. Well, when you don't talk about it and you don't deal with it, then people sort of begin to, to back away some and withdraw and, um, you know, you feel abandoned. And so it doesn't make matters better at all. It makes it worse. Uh, we don't really should, should not think of denial as something that we want to eliminate um, unless it's a real source of suffering and we want to help the person deal with that suffering. Um, but anyway, our, our thinking is changing about, about denial and the difference between um, interpersonal and intrapsychic denial. And as I mentioned, I had done research on this. We did a random controlled trial and that the research was about taking a look at what we do in hospice and palliative care because we meet people at that crossroads, at that juncture when they're seriously ill and we... Uh, we find that we're able to sensitively and carefully uh, help them deal with the reality. We'll talk about this in some of the cases that, that are coming up, but we, we don't, we didn't think it was harmful. We had these, we have these conversations with people. We're asking them what their hopes and fears are. We're asking them what they know about their illness. We, we explore the territory with them. We don't want to be hitting them over the head and saying, you know, you're dying and you've got to deal with this. That's the, an untherapeutic thing to do. The results of this research were that we found that actually people got better when we helped challenge that defense a little bit and help them understand what was going on and help them articulate what was going on, particularly um, with their family, where the conflicts usually are in the what we call the conspiracy of silence, which is which we'll come to a little bit. Uh, first, a, a difficult case study. Um, we'll talk about good and kind of bad situations. We, we think that uh, in the, based on that research that it's not roughly 10% or less of people that we could think of as intrapsychic, using intrapsychic denial, which was more of what Freud talked about, of that in uh, the impoverishment in, in inner resources to cope with harsh reality and the just, you know, refusal to acknowledge reality. Um, Kathy was a, a young 48-year-old uh, metastatic breast cancer patient in our hospice who uh, uh, was an extremely anxious woman. She had uh, an anxiety disorder on top of her uh, illness. And we would sometimes find her in her bed uh, with, the sh with, with, with the sheets held up over her head. And, and we couldn't, she, we, we would go and see and ask her how she was doing. And, she's, and she says, I need, to, I need to be hiding here in this place. I don't, don't take my sheet away from me. So she was clearly, a rather fragile human being, married to um, Randy, who was an auto mechanic, um, alcoholic, um, had been somewhat abusive in the marriage and relationship. And uh, we, you know, as we usually do in um, hospice and palliative care, we're kind of, you know, being supportive and trying to help him and give him support. Um, he had, I think, a, 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 it, it occurred to me, I realized in the course of uh, we're trying to work with him a bit that that there was a, a kind of paranoid personality. Um, uh, 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 he had aspects of paranoid personality disorder. And the last thing you want to do with someone in his condition is be caring and supporting because they assume you're about to stab him in the back. 
And he actually told some of the staff that he was going to murder me. Uh, he got uh, really pretty disturbed. So we set boundaries with him real quick and we, you know, made sure we kept form communication very formal with him. But this is a, uh, a, a case uh, where we don't want to challenge their defenses at all. We want to just, you know, help them cope with this and get through this situation as best they could. Unfortunately, he never, he never killed me, which was good. Um, was there a little joke about the distinction between people asking for help and won't admit they need help. So what happens when we're working with our patients and families is that um, in, in psychotherapeutic relationships, we are dealing with transference and countertransference, which is that um, people will tend to uh, redirect their feelings and desires and expectations um, on the therapist or, or on other helpers. Uh, mostly things that we learned in our family of origin, things we expect to happen. We call that the repetition compulsion, that it's more comfortable for us to, to, to see in relationships um, the same things we saw in our family of origin and to repeat those patterns over and over again. Oops, sorry. And the countertransference is the, is, is the sort of equal and opposite side of it with the therapist uh, who is bringing their feelings and their unconscious and conscious uh, thoughts uh, into therapy or into the therapeutic relationship, not necessarily, uh, you know, in the consulting room, but in the course of dealing with our patients and families, we have all kinds of therapeutic encounters with them, not just on, you know, in a private room. Uh, Freud thought that countertransference was really a, a, a detrimental to the, the growth and health of uh, people and patients particularly. And, um, um, now we think of it as much more of, of a tool that actually helps us understand the kind of dynamics that person has brought to the therapy and um, and, and what they're struggling with. It helps uh, you know identify the problem. So we try to bring out the and, and um, make visible and overt the countertransference, if you if you will, goes something like this, where we have this. You know, we all have a we have some points in the middle where we can either, they can be positive transferences or counter or negative transferences. Doesn't, isn't all bad. It can be, uh, but, but it does tell us a lot about what's going on in, in, inside people. And it's important, I think, to, to know about this because what Elizabeth taught us about therapeutic relationships uh, is first of all, that, you know, people who are dying are having a human experience, some would say a spiritual experience, and that it's not about the medical aspects of it. It's about the humanity, the humanness of it. And um, we don't want to try to un uncover a lot of old, deep issues with people. We want to help them um, reach uh, some some sense of completion. We kind of, we referred to it at one time as self-determined life closure, if you will, though not everybody dies with closure at all. Um, uh, we only do that at the invitation of the person. We can offer them the opportunity, but they have to, to, to be the leader on that. Um, transference with people who are dying often is much earlier and more intense because they don't have the time to just, you know, BS, if you will, or avoid talking about their issues. Uh, and that's, that's helpful. We have, um, as caregivers of people who are seriously ill and dying, um, have to have to commit to staying and not abandoning the person. This is a, a, a key issue. And I think Elizabeth would agree with this, that you, you, you can't um, just, you know, come into someone's uh, life or death and, uh, and then leave without, they have to have the feeling that you're, you're with them. You're going to walk with them throughout the whole experience compassionately with a compassionate presence. Um, and, accepting them with unconditional positive regard, as Rogers said, um, respecting their unique life experience. I feel a lot of times like, you know, we do detective work. We're always trying to sort of understand what their experience is, what their world is like, and, uh, you know, where there's pain, where there's pleasure, where there's um, unfinished work to do. So, um, like I said, meeting patients where they are, knowing about their condition, um, not trivializing their distress. And um, the, the ethical difficulty we run into frequently in many countries is when we have the 
triangulation of the conspiracy of silence, which is <clears throat> when um, we have the family ask us not to tell the patient that they're going to die or that they have cancer or that they're seriously ill because they're afraid that if, I, if we're telling them the truth that they're going to get sicker, they're going to die sooner and um, it's going to harm them in some way and it's going to make life, you know, their death, uh, not a good death, a bad death. Um, and I wanted to illustrate this point uh, by showing you a, a, a brief video clip of uh, an old uh, old colleague of mine, Richard Lamerton, who's making a home visit in this little two minute short clip. Dr. Lamerton, Dr. McTaggart, Dr. Mazzina's work on this. It's my sister. Um, you do know she doesn't know she's got cancer, don't you? Yes. So you, you won't um, say anything. I don't know. I won't say anything. She's not ready to hear. I won't say anything. She's not ready to hear. As the doctor told you. Oh, Nice to see you. How are you feeling? She's a bit better today. Yes. And uh, are you having any distressing symptoms? Well, I couldn't be dry at all. Really? You, you know, I've had the same trouble in this weather. It would be awfully nice to have a cup of tea. Yes, Thanks very much. Uh, tell me about this pain that you've been troubled by. Well, it's, it's in the bed. Yeah. It's just a trouble. Oh. I expect all doctors have had to share in a conspiracy of silence between yeah, patient yeah. and relative. Yeah. This patient has had a mastectomy, radiotherapy, and has lost two stones in weight. It would be surprising if she didn't have a pretty clear idea of the seriousness of her condition. What makes it worse? Well, it seems to be worse than trying to make my own. Where's the hope? I see you've had radiotherapy there. What was that for? Cancer, haven't I? Well, yes. How long have you done that? Yeah. I guess when the doctor stopped answering more questions. I see. And how long has that been? Several weeks? Well, Three, six weeks. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you know what your sister's just told me? What? That she had cancer and that she'd known for five or six weeks. So you know all the time. Well, I must say, I'm being kind of relieved in a way. It's been such a while. I didn't want to say to her. No, it's a lot easier if people talk about it. Breaking the silence in this way removes a lot of stress from patient and relative and will avoid a lot of guilt and anxiety for the bereaved later on. This is bound to make the doctor's job easier in managing the patient's home care. So we think about denial as about relationships and about the impact that that sorry that truth telling has on on relationships, um, it, and this was a, I think a very nice dramatized but you know uh, great example. We see we we have had this experience you know hundreds of times with patients and families where you're just a you know if you just can just bridge the communication, um, then there isn't a need for the conspiracy of silence, and um, this is usually what happens. We kind of think of it in a in a model of um, people on the side of impoverished inner resources, inability to cope with reality. We don't want to challenge their defenses. Um, interpersonal deniers. This was a good example of that. There was there was no um, interpsychic denial at all. But mo a lot of people are in between those points, and so we want to pace our interventions, not hit people over the head with facts but uh, be sensitive to uh, to where they are and helping them balance both hope and um, uh, uh, for cure and, and reality. Uh, Elizabeth once told me uh, that uh, you should, you know, you, you can tell people the truth three times. If after the third time, they don't want to hear it anymore, stop telling them. <laughs> was not bad advice. Uh, <clears throat> Another case example was um, a patient of ours who was uh, a younger uh, fellow, 45-year-old engineer who had two young daughters and his wife. 
uh, he had uh, made a, a fair amount of money with a engineering breakthrough and took a year off, took his family sailing in the Caribbean uh, on a sailboat um, for a whole year. Uh, had had them, you know, had, they were, if you will, kind of homeschooled during that time. And he came back uh, and uh, eventually developed uh, metastatic melanoma, um, probably, um, sadly, because of the excessive sun exposure he had. Um, he had joined a wellness center and he was convinced that if he would just maintain positive thinking, he would uh, get well. Uh, when I saw him, he was actually hardly able to get out of bed. He was quite weak. Uh, his wife knew how seriously ill he was, wanted him to try to face reality to some extent uh, because he, he, she felt for the daughters that it was important that he have a chance to say goodbye to them. And uh, so when I went to see him, uh, I asked him what he, what he knew, what he thought about his condition. And he said, he, I'm absolutely convinced I'm going to be cured of this. It's, I've, I've just got to keep thinking positively. I can't let negative thoughts in at all. And I said, okay, well, uh, well you know, that sounds like what you need to do right now. Uh, and uh, we then sort of regrouped and we actually got the head of the wellness center to come in and do an intervention to say that it was okay for him to acknowledge that he was actually, you know, very ill. And that if he thought about that, um, uh, that he, that he it wouldn't make him sicker faster or he wouldn't, uh, wouldn't harm him. And after that, he began to open up a little bit more about it. He never, he never really acknowledged that he was dying. Uh, but he did get a chance to, in his own way, in a kind of his symbolic language, <clears throat> a chance to tell his daughter's wife that he loved them and, and uh, uh, cared, cared about them. So uh, we only had him for about three weeks. It was about the best we could do. Hospice is a, almost, in a way, a kind of ritual, a new ritual. When someone's in hospice or referred to hospice, um, it's a, it be, creates a, a kind of ritual. Uh, you know, when we do these intakes, uh, that is curious because it creates an opportunity to acknowledge uh, impending death, and it gives an opportunity for people to, um, you know, to, to overcome these sort of conspiracies of silence. I think. <clears throat> so Elizabeth taught us a lot about what we mean by acceptance, and um, you know, sometimes. What we see more often is is a, is more of a kind of a resignation. You know, you've battled, you've gone through. She she you know obviously you know Elizabeth is responsible for the for the five stage theory of how dying patients respond when they're given this sort of bad news. But she was really very clear about how the how you know people um, often you know start with denial. They may not experience all of the five stages or seven stages. They may. Uh, uh, jump around from one to another. And it, she, she was certainly not rigid about it. Unfortunately, in society, you know, people found that to be such a kind of a face valid roadmap that they just started to almost superimpose it on the people that they saw and cared for. And it, uh, I think it gets in the way. Unfortunately, uh, it's quite important to, uh, to, you know, help people with these kinds of reactions, but it's certainly not necessary that you have to go through stages. And I think she was misunderstood a lot by that. Um, acceptance um, to me is really a sense that your life is complete, that you're in, you know, that you're, you're ready for the next chapter, that you're, that, that you have a sense of wonder about what's, what, what will happen next, kind of embracing of the, of the situation versus resignation, which is more like uh, just, you know, there's nothing else I can do about it. I'm just going to have to, to deal with it um, and move on. Um, so when we're, when we're helping people with this, um, uh, Robert Buckman gave us a nice little six step, um, um, way of breaking bad news. Some of you may have already, uh, be familiar with his work and there, there's, you can do, we could do a whole course just on this one slide, but, uh, it's important when we're, when we're talking to people and this is something we do when we're meeting people who are coming to palliative care is to make sure that we're, we're setting the setting the scene correctly. You know, there was a recent research study on the percentage of people who were told that their diagnosis over the phone versus told in person uh, or in a letter. And uh, obviously, the people who were told in person felt that it was a much. I mean, there, there was less anger. There was less 
bad reaction to the to the breaking of bad news. But you want to be, in, you know, in a private setting with the person uh, at eye level, um, avoiding jargon, um, and asking the patient what they think is going on. You know, what is their um, an understanding. It's a little bit like that research we did. It's the same sort of process of helping them explore what their what their hopes are. What they what are they hoping for? What are they afraid of? What do they know? What do they don't know? Um, and then asking them, uh, should I? What, what do you, the kind of conversation you have is um, some people some people like to know all the details about their illness. Other people kind of want just the general uh, results. Uh, a general idea. Some people want to have, uh, you know, family members, to, you know, to talk about, to talk about it, for us to talk about it with them. Just getting all that clear, you know, what, where are they in terms of, of um, what they want to know, how much detail, and do they want to know their, 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 the seriousness of the illness? Um, the, the great majority of people uh, do want to know their diagnosis and prognosis, in spite of the family's fears about these things. So you give the information to the person, you, without jargon, straightforward, and then you respond to their emotional response to that information with empathy and with compassion. And, uh, and finally, and most importantly, making sure that there's a strategy. We never say there's nothing more we can do. There's always more we can do, and particularly it's a time when we then give them, you know, let them know that there is a specially designed uh, healthcare service that will support their family and help them not suffer through the whole process. This little uh, woman uh, was a cancer patient with metastatic breast cancer in the oncology unit in the hospital in Bishkek in Kurdistan at the palliative care unit. And uh, of the 12 patients that were in the unit that day, she was actually the only patient who knew her diagnosis and prognosis. Uh, because she asked them to tell her what what the diagnosis and prognosis wa was. Many uh, in many places, uh, there's a real fear about telling the truth to patients. But this woman was a real fierce sort of warrior type woman who uh, who was uh, who was strong and, and wanted to know the information. Um, and we had to spend a lot of time teaching the palliative care professionals there about how to break bad news and how to and why it was not harmful to tell patients their diagnosis. But you will, <clears throat> you really have to work, this is, th these people are all in a family system and you really have to carefully explore this with families. When they ask you not to tell a patient, you ask them, well, what are you afraid it will happen if she does know the truth? You explore all that with them, you hear them. You don't just do that in a vacuum. You have to uh, take into account the family's reactions to, to truth telling. Uh, final cases. Um, this is uh, uh, Mary and John's is not their picture, but it's fairly close to what they looked like <laughs> when I saw them. Uh, and uh, Mary had metastatic breast cancer. She had bone metastasis. She had failed. She had gone through chemotherapy, several rounds of chemotherapy, and had failed uh, chemotherapy. And um, her husband, John, uh, uh, they were not talking about the seriousness of her illness, and so she was referred to hospice. And as I kind of explored with them what uh, what her fears were about him knowing her condition, because she clearly knew her condition, had, but was unable to talk to him about it. Uh, he had had a heart attack, a minor heart attack, um, about a year earlier, and she was really afraid that if she if they put this all out on the table, that he'd have another heart attack. Plus, in their families of origin both of their fathers had died before their the mothers so in the family the norm the norm was not for the for, for the wife or the woman to die before the man and so it was sort of not consistent with their uh, family of origin history um, and so we just did what you know we've been discussing which is exploring hopes and fears um, it, you know uh, talking about um, you know what's going on in the family and it was it was just an example like the, the one that um, Dr. Lamberton had of then all kinds of things began to open up for them. They began to share emotions and talk and uh, all, so many things that don't happen if people don't talk openly about the seriousness of the, of the illness. So many opportunities are missed. So much healing is, um, opportunities for healing is, are missed and reconciliation and love and, and deepening of relationships and closeness. Um, so there's a whole 
you know, positive side to, to the, to the truth telling story. So it, in terms of summarizing um, some of the things that we have talked about today and uh, some thoughts uh, about um, how you can make use of this in your, in your life and work, um, we need to, people have a right to decide how much information that they hear and they, they should, we should ask them what they, what they want to know and not know. Um, denial can be a protective mechanism. It can be adaptive or maladaptive. Many, for many people, hope is essential, um, but hope can be balanced with dealing with reality at the same time. And people times many, many times feel that ambivalence. Um, we, we, we uh, and this is uh, humanistic uh, philosophy, but also Elizabeth's, uh, I think, whole philosophy was accepting patience um, without judgment um, and accepting their who they are and their limitations in accepting and facing reality without judging them without, and, and I've seen too much judging. I think unfortunately, um, when we have to remember, we, we, we have to be able to tolerate their emotional pain and our own death anxiety. I had a patient's wife, uh, uh, a nurse, a new nurse uh, was having a conversation with the patient's wife and she was saying, well, we need to talk about what to do if he expires, which is a word we don't use in palliative care. Um, and uh, the wife kind of sarcastically responded, well, if he expires, can I get him renewed? <laughs> so we just, I mean, we have to be careful about words, but this was a, a, a new nurse in our unit that hadn't really dealt with, I think, her own, uh, her own death anxiety. We all have death anxiety and the extent to which we can tolerate our own anxiety about death, we can be much more helpful to people because people sense whether you're comfortable or uncomfortable with open and honest communication about death and dying. Um, we have to pace those interventions though to their reality, not our reality. It's not us who are dying, it's them who are dying. And we become, some of us, super consumers. You know, we've seen so many people die that we think we know the right way to die. Well, we don't know the right way to die. And that's the wrong way to think always about this. That, Every person is like is unique, is not like anybody else. And in a way, you know, every encounter we have is a cross-cultural experience uh, with other people. People even we think we know and we think they're like us could be very different than we are. So we don't want to impose any of our expectations on people. Um, right. Um, I like this quote to, to sort of end on, which is the more complete one's life is, the more one's creative capacities are fulfilled the less one fears death. People are not so much afraid of death per se, but of the incompleteness of their lives. This is from Liesl Marburg Goodman. And uh, finally, the, the gentleman without the turban on here is, my, is yours truly, uh, 1977 uh, <laughs> with Elizabeth. <laughs> and uh, I've changed a little bit since, since those days anyway. I want to thank you all for your for your kind attention. I hope it was a, a useful opportunity for us to share our knowledge. And now we'll hopefully have a chance to uh, to get some of your questions and talk a little bit about the things you'd like to to talk about. Thank you. Thank you again very much. Thank you, Stephen, for for your exposition. It was great. Uh, I hope everyone could take. Um, something from from all you said because it was a lot of information in so many so so little time yeah it was it was a lot in, in in short time and we have also a lot of questions but we have to choose some which maybe symbolize uh, the main issues uh, on the other side um so um vanina is asking um, from the point of view of the psycho neuro and doctrinal immunology you know this science this big science which integrates all the aspects of health, psycho, neuro, and uh, in immunology. Yeah, I don't know how you say it in English, but yeah. the whole word. Okay. Like immunology. Yeah, exactly. Well, she asks um, from this point of view, which is pointed out to, to look for healthy aspects in life, uh, in, in the body and how they interact, all these parts, she asks, 
um, it's about to change the chemistry of the body to 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 be healing and sometimes it's it's um, asked to like cover up a little bit the diagnosis and the prognosis prognosis in order to uh, focus on the healthy aspects or the healing aspects uh, is this kind of view um encouraging the denial aspect of the, the the hoping aspect of denial that's how she put it uh, puts it thank you vanina for your question that's a that's a great question and a difficult one and i think you know we've been talking here about you know the positives and the negatives of truth telling uh and um i i think uh what we're talking about here are kind of we also call it polymorphism of you know our nervous systems and how we all react differently to not just medicines but life experiences and i think it's really important to really understand who you're talking to who you're dealing with when you have a, a, a person suffering from uh, a serious life limiting illness and and really get a sense of you know how much they can cope with how much reality they can cope with um, uh, let, let me let me repeat that we've studied this actually quite a bit we find there's no evidence of shortened survival from truth telling it has no effect on survival in fact if anything we do have some evidence that palliative care may briefly prolong life i did some of this research and a number of other people have done this uh, research and it sort of stands to reason when we get people coming to us and they're train wrecks i mean a lot of them we touch them we bathe them we get their on their medication regularly we don't have to talk about dying we just want to talk about how they're what they're experiencing and how to help them get through it um, and then they get better actually for a period of time after they've come into competent palliative care quality palliative care and we'll see we see not uncommonly that they then start having you know communicating they start their stress levels go down they're avoiding oftentimes treatments that may actually shorten their life because of uh, their weak, weakened state. Giving people chemotherapies sometimes will actually, you know, beat them down more. So helping them make better decisions about the treatment. But we don't have any restriction on treatment in palliative care. I know there is in the United States, which is a mistake that was made many years ago. Um, but um, but they make better decisions. Some people go full bore for the treatment. Some people just go for quality of life uh, but um i i don't think we cause harm by helping people with these things in fact uh, i would say oftentimes the opposite uh, depending on the person i mean we've we, we we've acknowledged that some people we don't want that you know let them be in denial it's perfectly fine there's no problem if they don't have the inner strength to deal with that but we, after an initial sort of bad news reaction, what we see, what I saw in my research was that not knowing it maintains a sense of anxiety because people know something's wrong and nobody's talking to them. Uh, that that actually re results in stress that may harm the, uh, you know, the, the, the neurochemistry uh, in a person and may result in more suffering and ultimately you know, it's that sense of lonely, appre uh, lonely apprehension, anxiety, knowing something's wrong, nobody's telling you what it is. That was the result of the research I did. Uh, and once uh, the people, we actually stopped the research um, with the control group where we did post-tests uh, immediately after the pre-test with people without the intervention. Uh, I mean, it was two weeks after. Um, but we, we started actually because we actually thought we were harming people by not uh, having those conversations with them. So we began to give people the intervention after they finished their post-test, um, uh, uh, just from an ethical standpoint. But I hope I answered that question. It's, it's, there, there are no black and white answers. Everybody's different. So I, you, know, you have to use your judgment about what, uh, you know, whether you're telling people what you're telling people and how you, it, you know. But if they're saying they don't want to know, then you don't need to, you don't need to push it. In the event, control. Uh, so, Stephen, we have another question. Um, could you please expand the concept of cultural and psychological denial? 
Oh, great. Uh, well, um, I'm, I've been, you know, working in a lot of countries <laughs> um, and countries like, you know, Japan and places where, you know, you, you have this cultural tradition of, of uh, not telling people things. Uh, and um, we did in the United States. I mean, until the 1970s, we routinely withheld information on diagnosis and prognosis from cancer patients. It was the norm. And then society changed and ethics changed and people um, realized that, you know, people needed to have that information or at least have the option of having the information if they wanted it. Um, and it became the norm ethically for people to be told. Um, I think actually that denial is, is a psychological uh, issue, much more than a cultural issue. And that in society, we make it a norm to protect ourselves from having to deal with the emotions that are aroused when tr people are told the truth about these situations. That, um, that, that, that the cultural aspect of it is actually a result of psychological discomfort, <laughs> not the other way around. Yeah. And that's my clinical opinion on, you know, that you, you, you could disagree or agree with it, but um, I just, the fact is I've seen it in every culture <laughs> and I've seen it change. And I've seen the change not be harmful. So I think people need permission sometimes that it's, you know, that they're not hurting people when they have uh, authentic, open and honest conversations about what's happening. But, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Here's another question from Daniela. She asks if um, a person tells us she needs to have hope about that she's going to get over the cancer, for example. She needs to, to get over it. And we know she doesn't have, this person doesn't have any chances. And then she leaves us because we don't say it to, her, to this person. What should we do? Should we lie to this person? Should we go with this person anyway? Will we be with her anyway? How to do that? Let me understand. Let me try to understand this. So the patient is saying that the they, patient says, for example, she has cancer. This person has cancer, and, and the person says, "I need to have hope about how to to go over this." And we know the person doesn't have any chances to recover, for example. Yeah, right. and then right. the person maybe leaves us because we don't like like support that. Um, what do we do? Uh, Should we lie? Yeah. Lie to the person? How, how do no, we you don't. You, you don't have to lie, but you can. You can certainly support her need for. Uh, you know, uh, th this is a. I mean, if you think about it in terms of the sort of the theory that I've proposed today, this is somebody who lacks inner the inner resources to cope with this reality. She needs to 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 pretend, if you will, that she's going to get better. And our, it's not our job to take that away from her. It's not therapeutic to do that. So if your team were kind of saying, well, now you've got to deal with this reality. I mean, you're getting sicker and sicker. I mean, you have to deal with that. That's our problem, not her problem. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, you have to, you have to uh, you know, assess what she needs to survive this experience emotionally. And if it's to deny the reality and, and have everybody pretend that she's going to get better, you don't have to lie to her. You don't have to tell her the truth uh, if she doesn't want to hear it. I mean, she's made that pretty clear. That might change, though. I think you have to always be aware that people change. And I've seen, you know, people um, start out that way. And then over a period of time, as we create a compassionate, nurturing environment for them, they begin to feel okay. And, of course, you know, as... Um, You know, Avery Weissman said, you know, people kind of progress as, as they see their body getting weaker and weaker and sicker and sicker. Um, it, it, you have to be pretty uh, weak inside to be not actually acknowledging that reality at all. So, but I really think, you know, I, I've really seen that many times uh, our, our team members Have, feel like they have a need to make this person cope with the fact that they're dying, and we don't. It's her death, and so uh, if she's leaving you because you're telling her too much truth, well, then you know maybe you're you're not helping her. 
you, you need to help her do what she needs to do to survive the experience emotionally. That's my view. Victoria? Do have any time? Uh, Maru uh, left for us. I'm sorry? Oh, you're asking? Uh, no. Uh, well, I hope we have this uh, a time for an, an, a last second uh, a question. One more question. That's fine. Yeah. Um, this is about uh, the anxiety um, facing death from the perspective of the health professionals. Um, how can we deal with that kind of anxiety, our own anxiety facing death, the death of our patients, death in general? Yeah, uh, well, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, in, in, uh, in training people, we, 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 we first of all like to kind of assess um, to what extent this person can deal with death thing and death anxiety. We all have death anxiety. Um, well, I mean, there are exceptions. There are exceptional people who, who, who don't really feel death anxiety. Uh, but and my death anxiety has diminished over the decades. But it's been, it's been there. Um, but at least I'm comfortable with with the with the discussion. Um, uh, we did, we start out in the training you doing what we call a death personal awareness exercise. I don't know if you use that, but it basically is a guided imagery, um, taking a person all the way from being healthy and normal to getting a diagnosis, to getting sick, to getting sicker. And we do that through, you know, through a, a visualization. And then we bring them all the way to the point of death. And we usually played Pachelbel's Canon at that point as they were floating off. <laughs> and um, it, it was just a way of kind of helping people to, you know, directly confront their own, their own, uh, their own death. And, uh, and then, you know, I found it helpful. I think it, it helped make it okay for people to, um, you know, to real, you know, to, to deal with their own death anxiety. I, I, it's also a matter of, you know, not everybody's cut out to work with dying patients. In fact, most people aren't. And we have to be, you know, not judgmental about that, uh, but just sensitive to the fact that um, not everybody's cut out to work like not everybody's cut out to work in an emergency room. I mean, um, and uh, help if people come to realize that they just, it's just too much for them. What we try to create is a sense of what we call balanced empathy. This is about burnout. And um, when you get people coming into palliative care, usually if you think of it on a continuum from the, the, the palliative care worker, the nurse that moves in with the patient when they're dying and can't leave because they've got to be there when they die, to the cold professional who wears the starched hat and doesn't show an emotion at all. And we tend to get people on this side of that continuum when they come into palliative care and they get burned and then they run over to the other side and they kind of protect themselves, you know, start to cut off emotionally. And then they feel inadequate that they can't really help people because they're burned out uh, or feeling burned out. So from the beginning, we tried to teach people this idea about balance, uh, empathy, that we can be with people, we, but we can't um, live, I mean, the, the fact, whether they live, whether they die or not, it's not a, it, it, it's not the goal. The goal is for them to have a good experience and for us to help them, that it's actually not therapeutic for us to get to, uh, you know, to, for our boundaries to go so far that we, we become a burden on them almost, you know, by being around too much. <laughs> and, uh, just to show them to ha learn to learn to hang out, you know, to be compassionate, to be caring, but don't get carried away with it, and don't be cold. And, and the people people who can't find that middle ground believe eventually. Um, anyway. Uh, well, our time is up. We will start with um, saying goodbye to Melissa, our translator. She has to leave, and we are so grateful uh, that she was here. And I am still in the I'm speaking English. 
I mixed up. Eh, eh, Melissa, muchas gracias por haber estado. Eh, sé que tenés que irte, así que gracias. Eh, te despedimos. Eh, gracias, eh, Steven, eh, por, toda, por tu tiempo, tu, tu experiencia y tu exposición. Eh, quiero agradecer en nombre de todos nosotros, de EKR Argentina Uruguay, la presencia de todos ustedes ahí, la recepción que ha tenido este evento. Eh, quiero agradecerle a todo el equipo, eh, todo lo que han hecho para que esto sea posible hoy. Ha sido um, el, el, el fruto de mucho trabajo. Y bueno, quería avisarles que va a haber dos encuentros más para profundizar en este tema que el doctor Connor abrió hoy. El siguiente va a ser el jueves 13 de mayo a las 19 horas, mismo horario, con dos referentes locales muy importantes en el mundo paliativo, la doctora Ramos de Uruguay y el doctor Ariel Cherro de Argentina. Así que esperamos eh, contarlos con nosotros si están interesados en seguir por este camino. También queremos recalcarles, ahora van a anotar en el chat el acceso a la página web para que puedan suscribirse los que tengan ganas e interés en ver el video luego en, en el canal de YouTube, para que puedan acceder a él durante la semana que viene. Y bien, voy hasta allí, así Victoria puede hacer la traducción. Muchas gracias. Stay well, do good work and keep in touch. So, Stephen, let us say goodbye to you as well, and, and thank you really, a uh, very heartfelt thank you for your uh, presence today with us, for your expertise and inspiring presentation. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you. Keep up the good work. Thank you, thank you. Hey, so get I'll your vaccines. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> So our next meeting will be on, on next uh, th May 13th, Thursday at the same time with two important speakers from Argentina and Uruguay, both palliative care, very important professionals as well. Uh, we will be um, publishing the link uh, in our webpage for the, uh, people to uh, access our, the, the audio in our U video on our uh, YouTube channel. So that was all. So thank you, Stephen, so much. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>